let's start with our first session, which is keys for building a hyper growth sales organization. And for this session, I'd like to invite Neil Goldstein, head of sales um, at Monday.com and Jamison Paul, VP sales at Monday.com. Let's start. Hello. Hello, Jamison. Hello. Hi, Nir. Um, um, I'm seeing people asking if some of it will be recorded and, and, and yes, um, you'll get the materials later, promise to share with you all. Um, so it's good to have the two of you. Where are you based now? Just so that everyone see that we are also global. I'm in New York on Long Island. I'm currently in our office in Tel Aviv, in our headquarters. I'm also here in Tel Aviv. Great. So it's great to have the two of you here with us. And without really further ado, do you want just to present what we're going to be talking about in the next 40 minutes or so? Of course. So uh, thank you again, Leo, and thank you all for joining us today. And uh, this session, we, we wanted to share with you our uh, journey to create uh, a hyper growth sales organization. We want to share with you some of our experiences and main insights as to what are the key pillars and key elements in uh, you know, creating a fast-moving sales organization. Cool. And to understand the context, OK, this is the other way. Uh, let's start by sharing some of um, why, why do we even feel that we can talk about hypergrowth, right? What, what entitled us to talk about that? Yeah, so before we dive into our journey and, and we'll try to demonstrate what we consider as hypergrowth in, in our sales organization, some key facts about ourselves. Um, so we're currently, um, we have around 110 people in, in the sales organization. Uh, we're selling uh, to organizations in almost uh, 190 countries, over 200 verticals. Our sales organization was started when the company was three and a half years old, so fairly late in the company's life cycle. Um, the average deal we're currently running is 15K annual ARL. Our average sales cycle is 1.5 months, and we're selling to both enterprises, the largest organizations of the world, as well as to relatively um, you know, small companies from all verticals and all shapes. Jamie, Sunday, want to add anything? Um, Maybe just present the two. Present yourself for a second. Uh, for how long have you been with Monday, and and what's your journey in this? Sure, Neil, go go ahead and go first. Since you yeah. Been. So uh, my name is Neil Goldstein. I'm leading the sales organization, the rest of the world sales organization in Monday. Uh, I've been in the company for a year and a half now. And my group is currently divided uh, between Tel Aviv, London, and uh, Sydney. And my name is Jameson Powell, and I'm leading the North America sales team. And my teams are located in New York and San Francisco with some remote folks throughout. Great. So I'll move on to the next slide, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the revenue. Um, the chart on the left starts in 2017. Uh, I think this would uh, certainly be defined as a hyper growth organization. Um, I think the year prior, the company did zero to 5 million. And then in 2017, uh, shot up to 18 million. And in 2018, 50 million. And in 2019, which is the year I joined, uh, we did 120 million. And this year, we have the small task of 235 million. Um, that's the chart on the left, which is uh, revenue for the organization. On the right uh, is the sales contribution to the overall number. So it starts in 2018. So it's, it's, it's a bit off from the left chart. But in 2018, when the, when the business did 50 million, sales contributed 4 million of that. And during that time, sales was uh, more transactional. Right? It was helping customers. Uh, purchase, answer questions, make it easy to buy, easy to understand what they were uh, entering into and the value they would get. But in 2019, there was a shift. Uh, and that, that 16 million that we contributed against the entire company goal of 120, which was a net new of, of 70 million, that 16 million that we contributed was actually uh, shifted from a transactional 
um, sale to a consultative sale. So we went into an approach of uh, not doing transactional, but rather really helping the business understand the value across different departments, across different users and guests and features and functionality and all sorts of things they would get from it rather than just executing a sale. We were taking it a step further in that consultative approach. And that approach continues in our journey. Um, so this year we are tasked with 50 million um, of the total ARR of touch uh, business. All right. And next year we're excited to do 110 small feet. Before I move on to the next slide, I'll just ask everyone kindly to move their questions to your chat, to our chat. Um, the Q&A feature is not working for me for some reason, and I do want to see you ask questions, so you can just direct it to ask panelists, and I'll see them all or share them with everyone. I really don't mind either. It would work. Thank you. Moving on. Yeah, so uh, a little bit about our journey in terms of headcount and offices. Um, so the sales organization started here in Tel Aviv. And in 2018, we were around 25 people in the sales organization. Um, out of them, around 22 salespeople. Um, the sales organization also include additional functions like um, sales operations, SDRs, which are included in our sales org. And then uh, pretty late in this year, we started establishing an, um, uh, the sales organization in the New York office. 2019, we had a, a pretty significant growth towards 70 people in the sales org. Um, again, mainly divided between Tel Aviv and New York, almost half and half. And uh, this year, we, we continue the headcount growth. Uh, so we grew in Tel Aviv, we grew in uh, New York, pretty significantly, but we also opened uh, three new offices, um, an office in London, an office in Sydney, and an office in San Francisco, which is mainly customer-facing roles, so sales and customer success. This is a little bit um, the angle of the headcount growth in parallel to the revenue growth. And I think it's important to add that we we did the height of this growth as we were ramping through Q1, entering into Q2 to really accelerate it all during COVID, launching new offices, new sites, new employees that had never seen the office. Um, that scale continued. We didn't slow down the plan um, whatsoever, right? Nor onboarding, nor any dates and gates we had chosen. We executed across it. That's correct. So until, if until now we talked about just a little context of why we are here talking about hypergrowth, I think we can now dive into the topic itself. Nir, do you want to take it from here? Yes, of course. So we want to share with you again our thoughts and our main, and then what we see are the main pillars uh, in, in establishing hyper cells, uh, hypergrowth cells. But we feel that it doesn't start with cells. It's not only sales, um, it's not only about sales in order to create an hyper growth uh, revenue org. Before you, you even get started um, in you know, generating revenue fairly quickly, you need to make sure that you meet um, product market fit. Without that, you will just have, um, in, in the good case, a leaking bucket that whatever you sell, then those customers won't stay with you and it would be harder to grow the revenue year over year significantly. And you would see product market fit by uh, the customer's reactions, the ability to, to grow quickly, the ability to keep the customers with you with low churn. Another very important, very significant part in establishing a, a well-oiled um, sales machine is to be in sync with marketing. You need to make sure that you have a good functioning marketing machine it can be inbound oriented, it can be outbound oriented, it can be both, but it has to go hand in hand with a, with a growth of sales. Uh, so sales cannot play on it alone. And even once you establish those key elements, two key elements, it, it also a lot about the ongoing collaboration of sales with a product team to make sure um, that we maintain the product market fit and the product supports them sell deals, um, close work, close collaboration with marketing, with customer success, product marketing, and of course with uh, um, partners and channels organizations, 
which are in Monday, our separate organization to the sales. Um, there is a one question coming in about with regards to the marketing machine and how much is it expected to continue being so significant for us in relation to inbound? Can you say a word on that near before we move on? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a good question. Nobody knows exactly the answer. Obviously, we, we grew a lot and very fast based on the inbound. And I think inbound is here to stay, at least in the upcoming two years. Um, but we were, uh, I wouldn't say we're relying only on that. Um, so we have a very large customer base of more than 100,000 paying organizations, which is what we see in the sales as a very significant growth engine. Um, so we're, we want to grow with our customers um, and make them more and more substantial, as well as um, you know, learning how to reach out to an organizations and doing more outbound, but uh, it will take time. And I think that um, inbound would be very significant for us, at least in the upcoming 12 to 18 months. Cool. All right. So <laughs> enough of context. Jamison, walk us through the first pillar that we defined here as culture and compensation model for hyper growth. Yes. So um, you know, look, there's a lot of uh, uh, things to focus on when you're trying to scale a business, but we really feel like uh, these are the most important. And this, this being the first one is around culture and compensation. If you're going to make um, investments in hiring the best talent, you want to get the most out of that talent and you want to make sure that you retain that talent and they grow with the business. So choosing the right compensation model is critical. And this is a problem most, you know, sales organizations have, right? It's, it's, uh, someone's always trying to be clever with the system. You have to do the planning process for outcomes and behaviors. You then have to roll it out, maybe at your sales kickoff, the reps have to learn it. Uh, the reps have to constantly check um, their deals and the commission they'll get per deal, looking at the statements before and after commissions, right, to make sure finance pays them correctly, trying to reach, you know, accelerators in certain ways and maybe gaming the system. And then the new year comes and the business will reflect, make some changes, and the process starts all over again. It becomes quite distracting. So what we decided to do was um, focus on a no commission model. We are a flat compensation organization across the board. And what that allows us to do um, is really put the customer first. Um, we're not focused on landing that deal in order to uh, obtain commission. We're, we're focused on getting the best outcome long-term for that customer and our business. Um, uh, it also aligns the entire sales organization to the entire company. Um, this, this means that you, you are tied to the long-term growth goals and you're focused on pure collaboration across the business, right? Because everything is a collective. Everything is, is focused on helping another um, gain success uh, where that use case and that success story can, can go throughout the business. So we don't look at sales as differently, right? We have a marketing department that is outstanding. Uh, we have product department that's outstanding. All these departments are outstanding just like sales, but we are not out there um, chasing accelerators, launching ourselves to President's Club and doing anything different because we're focused on this greater goal. And that's a really, really unique um, approach. It also allows for um, changes, right? It allows you to be really, really agile because we can make changes that don't impact someone financially. Right? It's, it's best for the business, so we're all going to shift in a certain direction or implement something or try something. And it's okay to try something and fail because there's no impact on it. But let's, let's see if this moves the needle towards the direction we're after. Um, so I, I think it's a really, really unique model. And I also think it does something quite special for the management team because it kind of brings out you know, the best in them around can you actually lead and can you actually motivate without spiffs or some commission trigger? Um, can you actually drive business with these individuals around a flat compensation model? Um, and we've seen tremendous success with it. What is challenging about it? You know, let's not pretend it's all 
Yeah, rainbows th- and butterflies. No, no, I, I I agree. So there is some challenges with it, right? Because you know some folks want to um, join a company where there there's absolutely no cap on what they can they can make, right? So they expect a certain base, which is low risk for an organization. Then they've got this commission scheme and and the business is saying you can achieve all of this and maybe they can, right? But maybe something like COVID would impact it, um, impact their earnings. But beyond just what their on-target earnings are, what is their accelerators and what where can they go? So um, th- that that is a challenge, right? Because what we're saying is, look, we have this flat compensation model, which may be near a standard OT, but there certainly isn't any accelerators on top of it. What, what the challenge then is though, is if you find the right people, and we talk about that a little bit later, you will get people that are aligned to the long-term goal. Because if you look at your earnings across the four years and the vesting schedule, um, along with the career path and such, you, you, you will kind of uh, wind up on top of some great earnings years with uh, on target earnings and accelerators. But you have to be able to articulate that message, be transparent and share it so people get it. But not everybody is comfortable with that. Now, not everybody wants a flat pay structure, um, which is where the hiring profile comes in. So there are many, many questions coming in. Um, we knew it's a very exciting topic and a, quite a controversial, controversial model. I'm trying to pick. So, so can one of you just very quickly, a little technically explain exactly what it means, a <laughs> compensation model that is flat because people are asking. Yeah, and another so, question again, and if you can address on how do you think it affects the talent pool that we have access to? It's a question. Lior, just, um, sorry, Jameson, just a quick comment uh, for people to get the full perspective. We, um, we do like have a fixed salary or no commission, um, but one part, one significant part of our compensation are significant options, company stock options for the company. So we're trying to tie the company's success with the individual success in the long term. I think it's, it's worth mentioning that. Correct. And I think like an example would be if an organization was paying their sales reps $10 and you can make another $10 in commission, we might be offering that individual $18. Okay. Pretty close to an on-target earnings um, where it's fixed salary, right? So there is no commission, but it is a good salary um, uh, for the work, along with, like Nir said, options, career paths, so upward movements and, and um, uh, progress. Um, but th- that's how it works. And regarding, I mean, never mind the talent. We're going to address talent on a different note. So, so let's keep one, this one for later. Um, okay, moving on. And as I promised, remember, we're going to answer all of the questions later on a different note, so no worries on the question. The second pillar we ad- identified together was agile structure, right? Um, Nir, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so agile structure, agile sales strategy, agility is a key. Constant adjustment to optimize business. And when you set aggressive targets like we do on sales and we need to grow very aggressively year over year, we consider it as running marathon and sprints. Uh, So you really need to be optimized for business and making adjustments when you feel there are gaps or misalignments. Um, We wanted to share here a few examples on how we changed our sales structure and sales strategy along the way and we did it fairly quickly to adjust to our you know aggressive targets and what's going on with the market and the type of uh, leads and deals that we see so jameson mentioned that you know early on when we started the sales in 2018 we were fairly transactional in our sales we were talking about very quick deals, low um, amounts or low average deal sizes of few hundreds of uh, dollars um, in ARR. And we did a pretty aggressive and and, uh, fast shift into value-based selling. What we practically did, we raised the bar for minimum uh, deal size. It started from, you know, setting a a minimum deal size of $1,500 um, in ARR and it grew pretty significantly and pretty fast um, up to the minimum that we have today, which is 7K uh, minimum deal in ARR. 
And that pushed the entire sales organization, you know, to longer sales cycle to discuss value, uh, the value proposition uh, much deeper with our customers and obviously drove the larger deals. Today, we have multiple deals, six-figure deals a month and uh, many uh, five-figure uh, deals every month. This is one transition that we did and we did it f fairly quickly. Um, our compensation model. Yeah, before you move to the next point, how did we, what made us shift so quickly? What was it? So I think, first of all, we're, we're a big bottleneck or a big slowdown um, in, in imposing changes in the compensation model. When you affect people's salary, uh, people, you know, tend to um, uh, not to go along with, you, with the changes that you're planning to deploy. Uh, they have concern, obvious concern that their salary would be impacted and it's harder, you know, you need to consider the individuals and not only what's best for the business. The fact that we went with a fixed um, uh, compensation structure allowed us to do all those changes toward the benefit of business without impacting individuals. Right, uh, so I, but people I meant went it, along with us. This is one aspect, I meant it more on the market Business yeah, to add, to to add to that, Leo, right. part of the reason to move so quickly in that direction is how do you actually look at sales contribution, right? So, you know, we have this kind of no touch engine on the small area of SMB sales is helping it along. We want to go up market and add more value. So we focus on a certain minimum employee count, but we also focus on a minimum order value. That doesn't mean, let's say it's $10,000. It doesn't mean we won't help a customer through for 5,000. It just means we don't claim, right, the contribution. Mm -hmm. that's, that's success for the business. We're happy that they, uh, they joined for $5,000. We will continue to develop and work them. And if we can ever get them over the threshold, we will claim contribution. But this allows us to really drive um, the difference between no touch and sales contribution and make sure there's no conflict because we're collaborating together for the ultimate success of the business and the customers. Yeah. So I mentioned, I mentioned um, uh, one of the changes that we've done and we're, by the way, we're constantly doing that is uplifting the minimum deal size. Um, I'll touch upon in the upcoming uh, pillars that we constantly analyzing the data and trying to understand where, which areas, um, you know, we have the biggest opportunities or biggest bottleneck that we need to update. Uh, one of those areas that we, we have identified um, was around the split of the roles between AEs and uh, or account executives and account managers. So traditionally, again, 2018, early 2019, a salesperson in Monday used to close new business coming from inbound leads and afterwards held that account and continue to grow them. What we noticed a long time is that due to the relatively high volume of uh, inbound leads, uh, people are tend, tend to focus on the inbound leads, the leads that are, you know, the deals that are coming and proactively reaching out for us, uh, short-term goals uh, in order to close business and, and um, you know, meet the monthly targets. And uh, we, we didn't think we're optimizing the long-term um, customer, existing customer expansions in that, in that way. Um, so around mid-2019, we've decided to split into two separate roles. We've got the account executives, which are working on purely on new business. They're getting the inbound leads. Uh, converting them into a paying customers and then handing ending over the accounts into the account managers. The account managers are working on well-defined portfolio of existing customers, only on those customers, and their goal is to expand those customers um, so they can have a, a deeper overview of their accounts, plan mi um, mid-term, short-term, um, short mid-term, and long-term where do we want to uh, be with those uh, customers in that portfolio and do their you know, longer term investments? I think One of our next steps that we're planning is to separate these into two uh, business units or separate teams. So the managers would, be, um, would have the expertise around new business 
and existing customers as well. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I think another really great example of, of optimizing and, and being agile, even if it's short term, you know, we, we have a, a, a mid-market bar, right? Say it's 1,500 employees. Uh, that would be the threshold for mid-market up to 1,500. And that's where enterprise starts. But being agile allows us to look at what's happening currently. And if we had an influx of enterprise opportunities, we discussed quickly towards the end of last year, we lifted that bar up to, I think it was 4,500 employees. Mid-market would work those opportunities to rebalance um, what was going on at that time. And then after you know a month or two, we brought it back down. But this allows us to do what's necessary for the customers and for the business, whether it's short term or some of the examples near gave, which is long term strategic plays. Yeah, iterating back to the compensation model, that that is more much more challenging when you have a commission based uh, structure and many individuals that wouldn't like that shift of the deals on, and leads between different teams. That's right. Moving on just because of time. So the third pillar yeah. would be KPIs and data. Yeah, so um, KPIs and data, um, I think data is a, is a very important element in every sales organization. You want to uh, drive your decisions uh, based on data. Um, one key element is the, that the KPIs are driving the behavior. Uh, for example, most sales organizations are setting targets, annual targets for um, for the sales individuals, and we do as well, by the way, like, uh, like any sales organization, each sales rep, although we're working on uh, no commission, has their own targets broken into quarters and months. Um, but one, one example of different KPIs that we are setting, we want to set, we want to drive the, uh, the team collaboration. Um, so we are setting KPIs for the team. Um, we want to see the team target um, and how many people overachieve within a certain team. And what, one great behavior that it drives is that when someone met their uh, personal target for a certain month or a quarter, they would collaborate with their um, teammates and with their partners to make sure that they reach their targets as well so the team would reach their target. Um, I think it's not um it's pretty exceptional behavior um in, among sales teams. Uh the the second part of the data driven decision is you know constantly analyzing data. Um we have around 250 TV screens in our office um showing dashboards uh, to to all of the people so we're constantly analyzing almost every angle of the of the data and i think what's unique in uh, in our um, approach is that we don't keep the data only for um you know uh, a, a small group of managers or uh, key individuals we share it with everyone because we believe that every individual uh, um, can and actually responsible to, to you know, learn the data, identify bottlenecks, identify opportunities. So instead of you know, only five or 10 minds trying to identify what's, the, what's our next step in our optimization, we have 110 people within the sales org that are trying to identify what we should do next. Um, there is a question coming in about whether we can share a best or a favorite KPI rather than just ARR, if there's anything else we are measuring that we can talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, ARR is big, like any sales organization is, is a key, is, is a key um, data um, or a key KPI. But as I mentioned, we're not looking at it only in the individual manner. Um, we're looking at it also in the team level, in the group level, that's what ultimately we're driving for. Um, but we are looking at um, constantly analyzing our win rates, our average deal sizes, um, the average sell cycles to make sure that we are constantly improving and uh, optimizing our business. Um, by the way, an interesting uh, thing that we've done, I think one of the things that works best for us is the previous slide of the celebration. Um, 
So a very nice thing we've done, I mentioned that we have 250 uh, TV screens only in the TLV office and a similar amount in the New York office. And what we what we actually done is that every time where a salesperson or a partner closes a, a deal, um, we have a celebration across all the screens. Um, any so size of deal there? I'm sorry to sorry? Any size of deal? Any size of deal. Uh, again, we have minimum deal size. Um, so it would be 7K and above. Or expansions, as you can see here, that are that can be lowered. Um, but that, that actually connects the entire company to that celebration, the product people, the R&D people. And it really drives the motivation uh, sometimes when we have a large deal that we close in Tel Aviv, for example, we don't claim it until the New York office people are arriving to the office. We want to celebrate together. Um, I think it's a great driver for motivation, and I really recommend all the companies out there to consider that. One, one thing to add, um, not only do we have all these TV screens with all different data sets all over the place um, and, and make sure everybody understands how to, how to read the data, um, we also get a daily text every morning with key KPIs and key stats. It, it's the same message that goes to our board of directors as well. Everyone in the company, everyone gets this message with key stats. Uh, and some of the favorites that Nir mentioned are also mine, but we also look at WAP, which is weekly active paying people. How active are the people that are actually paying us for value? How active are they on the platforms? So we make sure to monitor that and, and work towards that. But sharing that data uh, every morning um, across a text message is very, very helpful. Just like we share our, our board of directors presentations, our board meetings with everybody in the company. So they see all the data, everything in the company so that they can help make um, decisions uh, that are best. Great. Moving on to that. That's weird. To the fourth one, uh, yeah, which is processes and platforms. Yeah. Yeah, processes and, and platforms and important to say business operation as a whole. Uh, the idea here is to try and automate um, processes in order to speed up. Um, so tools and platforms can be a real bottleneck um, or, or a real business accelerator. A few good examples is, um, you know, uh, when we started here, the sales organization in 2018, we were using an in-house CRM system which was pretty um, intense, pretty um, good, but every, imposing every change took us a lot, a lot of time. And at some point, it really became a bottleneck. Um, so at that point, after we were running a while, uh, with that in, in our CRM, we've decided to switch to Salesforce. That allowed us, again, to do quicker adjustments um, according to the the way we do the business and really allowed us to run faster. Um, the SDRs, we have acquired SalesLoft um, that allowed the SDRs almost instantly to handle 4X am the amount of leads that they're um, handling. And we're talking about massive inbound uh, amounts. We have a few hundreds of uh, inbound leads a day. Uh, so that's pretty significant. Um, another good example is working with R&D to constantly get um, smart notifications from our platform, from our uh, data center to the salespeople to notify when, um, for example, there is a jump in the engagement or in the account or when senior titles are added to the account and that shows that we have an opportunity out there. Um, so this is uh, one example. We have a very strong business uh, operations team and a fairly large one, nearly 10 people. So um, when do we start but, it? When, when did we start it? And when do you think that we should start one? It's a question coming up. Um, this, when did we start it with the business operation uh, team? So when the, did we the bring first, the first business dev person, yeah. Yeah, um, it was... It was late uh, 2018, and I think it's a must for um, for even small sales organization. Um, having a strong business up is a force multiplier. Um, these people, you know, are really real enablers of the um, of the uh, sales organization. In some cases, when we had um, a limited headcount, we've decided to hire one or two salespeople less, 
and have more business operations, uh, think about it like when you have 110 salespeople in, across the organization, if that sales uh, business operation person can improve, you know, 5% uh, the um, execution of each sales rep, you, you gain five, five reps just, just by, that, by doing that. Um, so it's, it's a very important part, integral part of the sales, uh, sales team. And what they're actually doing, they're, they're running across the entire teams um, and identifying successful behaviors, the learning what our top achievers are doing and trying to replicate that success across the team. Um, another pretty smart investment we've done early on as a company is to put a lot of investment in certifications around privacy, around security. Um, we're running a SaaS business. Uh, so privacy and uh, data security is a big thing for many of our customers. And the fact that we did that investment and sometimes it's a significant investments. There are certifications that cost a quarter of a million dollars to achieve and, and even you know more than that. But that really expedited some of the large deals that we brought in. And I uh, really recommend SaaS companies to consider um, those investments early on. Moving on to the fifth one and last pillar is talent and training. Yeah. Yeah. Fifth and final pillar. Um, and this was, this was raised prior, right? Somebody was asking about talent on the compensation model and all of that. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's critical to uh, partner with HR. They are your business partner. Um, and you have to have that relationship and alignment to not just like a hiring schedule, right? They've got to be part of the, overall plan, the overall processes, and the timing um, as to when you're going to execute um, those moves or those specific hires or promotions or uh, lateral shifts or whatnot. Um, so so that they help us uh, a lot in not only profiling um, the right candidates for us, right, that would be aligned to our culture, our values, um, um, and our, on our growth path based on experience, they also help us with our current needs because the needs six months ago might be different than the needs today, which goes back to us being quite agile and how we, how we move things around. Um, and then they help us maintain and execute the processes that we can put, put in place for the interview, right? So how do we, how do we work with um, the, the right people? So there's a collective that have, these are the stakeholders that have a say in the process and put the candidate through the absolute best experience possible uh, in the shortest amount of time possible that still gives us everything we need. We haven't had an issue attracting talent. Um, we, we have leveraged external recruiters. Uh, we also have our own internal recruiters. Um, there's been times where we've even leveraged like a, a BPO um, to accelerate things as well, but we give uh, different recruitment firms that, that specialize in different areas, that area of focus. Um, so they can execute the plan. And by the way, that plan, that annual plan that is designed, that has every headcount um, across every team, across every role is shared with uh, not only the HR recruiters and the HR business partners, but also the external recruiters. So they understand not only where we are, but where we're going. So they too can get ahead of it. Um, so from a talent perspective, we've got some just absolutely amazing people. It's one of the most diverse um, and collaborative environments I've seen. Um, we haven't uh, had people depart, which is a great sign that, that uh, they're happy to be here. We've had great success, um, you know, contributions from them. Um, but we've also had a lot of really great talent come and say that they, they wanna be a part of it. Um, and going through the process that we do, we're able to say whether or not we think that they will be successful here. Um, uh, and, and, and part of this that I also think is really, really important is not only the alignment and the process, but we take our candidates through this long-term plan. So it's not just you interview and then here's an offer. It's, it's mutual. We really make sure they get to know us, especially now when everything's remote but we would give them the office tour. We would show them the boards. Uh, now we pull them up online. We take them through the overall plans, where we've been and where we're going. We show them where they are in the overall plan. This is you. This is how you contribute to the overall success. And I take them through a four-year plan. 
So this is what career pathing would look like. This is what the compensation would look like. This is what the options would look like. This is the value of the options. Um, and that way they can really make a very, very good decision as to whether or not they can be successful here, whether or not they want to be here um, uh, and, and join us for kind of the long-term growth plan. We also have a very good 30-day onboarding program. Um, we have a great enablement team. They take everybody through about a three to four week onboarding experience, um, which has gotten really great reviews by everybody that, that we brought on board. It sets them up with a nice foundation. What we're working on next is trying to implement more of the continuous enablement and development following those 30 days. Um, but that, that's our approach to uh, talent and training. Jameson, just closing the loop on the compensation, um, can you elaborate a bit about the profile of the sales reps we are looking for? How, I mean, you, you, you come from other organizations, so you've seen other compensation models. We, we, How does we, it differ? Yeah, they, don't, they don't differ that much, right? We have different profiles for different needs, and we have the way we try to balance teams is um, high potentials, right? They may have less experience, but high potential. And we believe in our training and onboarding program and our collaborative model, and then moderately experienced and then highly experienced. And we tried to find balance across those teams, across those hires. Um, so that's not just one hiring profile. We also developed a career path that allows us to have those folks fit into certain areas and have a very accelerated path to senior. So you can move up in our organization every six months following onboarding and ramp. Every six months, you can receive a promotion uh, until you're a senior and then it becomes annual. So folks know, okay, I'm going to come in here. These are my requirements around um, quantity. Uh, these are my um, um, uh, requirements around competencies, right? So these are the expectations. I have to be autonomous by this time. I have to be able to do this, that, and the other. Um, and that allows us to fit in the talent and balance the teams. Maybe uh, just to add to that, I think that... Um Culture is a big thing in Monday, so we put a lot of stress in the hiring process on the culture fit. And we want to make sure that we hire people who would know how to collaborate in a team who are looking to make an impact um, company-wide. That's a big thing for us. Uh, so we're not only looking for you know, achievers with, a, with an amazing track record of success. Obviously, we want that. We're, we're, we are looking for experience and um, uh, sharp salespeople, but not in on the expense of, uh, of, you know, having a culture fit. And then there's another important question that just came up on um, what do we do, Jamison, back to your career path uh, description. What if someone does not want to become a manager or take the path of management? Do we have alternatives for that? Can you talk a bit about the IC concept? Yeah. And, you know, even recently we've, we've uh, had folks in sales apply for uh, pre-sales engineers roles. We had people move into enablement, um, but we actually designed uh, our career path off a Y model. So the accelerated growth at the bottom uh, before senior is a few steps and there's a couple steps to seniors. And once you get to the Y, right, where the path continues up the stem, either left or right, to the right is a management path and to the left is a more advanced senior um, uh, individual contributor role. And what we tried to do in that Y model is make sure that a, a senior strategic AE is equal to a manager, let's say, right, a sales manager. So folks can have an exciting individual contributor career path here um, that is no less great than a management you know, career path track. But we give everyone the opportunity to make their way up that Y and they kind of come to an intersection and they can either follow the individual contributor route or the management track or jump uh, at some point. Okay, if anyone wants to ask anything else, uh, this is your time or... <laughs> um, actually, the next session will be very tied to this one, so questions can still come up later. Um, and actually, we're on time, so why, why be late if, if we don't have to? Jamison, I thank you for your time. Nuri is staying with us for the panel. Um, Thank you.